What's good? What's good? Welcome everyone back to the show. Recap with Mo. For tonight, we're going to go ahead and get into this this Power Book 2 Ghost um, Season 3 Episode 2 titled Need vs. Greed. Now, let me go ahead and say this before I get into it. Please like and subscribe to this channel if you like this content because there's a lot more to come. We're going to go ahead and break down some of these characters a lot more and get into some details. So please like and subscribe to this channel. But let's go ahead and get into this dialogue. All right. All right. So first things first, we see Lauren who's waking up in the hospital bed. And as she's awakened, uh, we see um, Jenny Sullivan by her bedside. So as she awakes, Jenny is you know, telling her everything that has transpired. Does she remember anything or this is what happened? So as she's talking, we're seeing where Effie is, you know, clicking her in. She's um, fixing the emergency, you know, brake, allowing it to go into neutral where she's able to push the car into, you know, the bed of water. So uh, we see Effie standing on the left side of the vehicle at that time with the door ajar. So, she pushes the car into the, the the body of water, and the only reason why Lauren was able to survive that incident is because there was a bystander who was out walking his dog at the time. And um, as Jenny stated, if that guy was not there, this could possibly be a whole different type of discussion. Not with you, and that's what she meant. Um, but um, so so Lauren wakes up from that situation where it was a dream of course, and it's morning time at that time, and Jenny Sullivan comes in, and she's asking, is she okay, and Lauren states, what's going on, am I able to call my parents at this point, because she's getting to the point now, like, I'm ready to go, like, I'm tired of sitting in this house in, in seclusion, I'm ready to just call it quits, and, um, and Jenny is like, no, you can't go yet. We don't have enough, you know, enough information. Woo, woo, woo. And Lauren tells Jenny that Effie was the one that tried to kill me. You know what I'm saying? She was the one that tried to kill her. And um, and then Jenny conveys to her, you know, hey, that's that's small fish. We really trying to get to the people who are at the top because it's not Braden and it's not Effie that we're really after. Who we're really after is this guy right here. And she shows her a file of Tariq. And she said he's the kingpin of this whole situation. And that's what she really wants from Lauren. She needs some information from Lauren. Like, I need you to give me some information or at least be able to tie Tariq to all of this stuff that we got going on around here, right? And Lauren... You know, I had put in the preview video that I stated, you know, this would be a big test for Lauren. Is she going to stick by, you know, Tariq and not really say anything? Or is she going to get impatient because she's ready to go home and just tell her some shit, you know, to get her out of that situation? So I was glad to see Lauren stick up and say, no, I really don't know. But she was actually telling the truth to a certain extent. That's what I feel um, because she has not seen Tariq doing anything out of the way. Um, but she, I mean, but she has been in the context with him when he's received strange, strange phone calls and different things like that, where he had to leave abruptly. So who knows? Um, so next we see Tariq, Effie, Kane, and I believe Brayden at the warehouse where they're trying to divvy up, you know, all the work. And we see Noma's right hand man. I think it's Obi or Obi. I think it's Obi. Uh, he's checking in on him. He's pissed off because he has to stay within the States. He can't go back home. He's mad because he's having to babysit. So Effie is talking to Kane like, can we trust them? Next? And he was like, yeah, these my folks, you know, Jamaicans or something like that. And uh, he was like, they good, they good. And then we see the conversation with both Brayden and Tariq. Now, Brayden is like, we need to do this you know, big, we need to get these people down in my, my father's job. And Tariq is like, hold on, we just two seconds out of the, you know, out of the frying pan, bro. We hot as chicken grease. And you talking about taking this down to, you know, your the corporate America. Like, that's not what we're going to do right now. Next, we see Monet and Davis. So Davis pops up once again at the house. And of course, she's watching one of those judge shows once again. So Davis brings 
over a police file telling all but a little or nothing. You know, she's pissed off at this moment because I got you on this job. I need you to really find out the details of what happened to my son, Freaky Ziki. But ain't nobody giving me no information. And I'm getting, you know, I'm really getting pissed off at this moment. So he stated that this is pretty much it. Like, this is all the file that the police has currently on this whole situation. Now, I'm thinking, that cannot be it. Is somebody else pulling files from there so they can do their investigations? That's really what I'm thinking is going on. But I'm going to stay tuned to see if that's what the case is. Because if all you're telling me is what he got shot with, not where he was shot, what what he had on, y'all, y'all, you know, just the basics then I'm really concerned about that police department because nobody is investigating anything if that's the only thing that's in there at that point in time. But I'm really hoping that somebody else has pulled information out of the file so they can do their own investigative work. And and maybe that may be Jenny Sullivan because he seems to hell have a whole lot of information about Tariq and everybody else in between. So maybe that's what she got going on, right? But did y'all notice on the wayside, you saw your boy Lorenzo sitting on the side in the little dining room area trying to ear hustle, trying to see what exactly was being told to Monet. Because he he knows eventually he's not going to be able to hide this shit for two months longer. And eventually something is going to go down where it's going to spill the beans. So he's just trying to hear what he can hear so he can, I mean, properly prep. I mean, I would be afraid too because Monet is a heated gun right now. She's popping off on everything that's moving. So I don't want no parts of it. I don't want <laughs> I don't want no smoke. So next we see Sax and, and Sullivan. So Sax comes over to Sullivan's crib to to bring over a cup of coffee, right? And you know that he, he's just trying to get him good graces, but he also trying to get something else too. But he ain't getting none of that because the nigga ain't brought anything. Another thing to notice here is um, Sullivan states that she needs her CI to bring her some information. So for everybody that's still going on and on talking about is Effie or is this person, this this person, if you read um, even some of the commentary that's out there or even on the Star's website, you will see that under the bio for um, sex that he is the CI. So it's no question, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But even in this scene, she says, if my CI will bring some information. So let's go ahead and scrap all of the rest of that. So um, she needs him to bring her some information. He talks about he's still working on it. But really what he's trying to do is get in them draw. Enough said. We're going <laughs> to Enough said. We're going to move on, man. But um, so we're back at the office at... Um, uh, Weston Holdings. I'm sorry, my mind went blank for a moment. So we're back at Weston Holdings, and we see Kiki Fontel at the office, and she walks in, and she's bringing a file for one of the the workers, and he looks to be, a, you know, asleep on his desk in his cubicle. So she passes him on top of the head, wake your ass up. I need you to do this. Whoop whoop whoop. He calls her some, you know, I forget what, um, I can't even remember. I think the girl that used to work with Trump, I can't even remember her daggone name. Um, but anyway, you know, and, and Braden was sitting by the wayside. It was like, what the hell, bro? Like, that's not what we're going to do. But, you know, from the first time that he's met Kiki, he had something for Kiki. He's been down with Kiki ever since he saw her. So, he going to do whatever he, he can do to get in. In, in good graces with Kiki, man. So, uh, and we'll see that later on in the episode. All right, so now we head over to the Take headquarters where uh, Rashad is over there talking briefly to some guys. I assume they work with him when we see Aaron comes in to see Rashad to convey to him, hey, you need to switch up your campaign. Right now it's not working. Um, you need to bring in some new blood, some new guns. And and and, and Tate is like, yeah, I got that going on. I got that coming. So I believe at that time that he was quite possibly talking directly about Tariq. But as we know throughout the episode, it changed to his classmate. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I believe that's what he was talking about when he was talking about that new blood, a new gun in there to make to generate new ideas. And also 
hit the ground to bring in campaign dollars, right? So, um, and then he also <laughs> he also mentioned that you need to get your ass a wife. Like, somebody needs to step in and be that woman on your arms that we can see and we can, you know, parade all around and make you look like a good American citizen. Because right now, you ain't looking like that much and you falling behind on the polls. So, get it together. And he rolls up out of there, right? All right, so now we head back over to the school where we see them in the classroom setting and they're um, talking about this specific question that the, that the professor brought up. And that question is, what is the line or the lie between need versus greed or need and greed, right? And I, And let me just say this. I like the way the writers, you know, weave the, the title of the episode within to the conversation of the, the episode because we're able to see and think deeply about that topic. And I was enjoying the conversation. I was enjoying the thought process of these young people in this classroom. And, and then also some of the jokes within the classroom. And um, so Diana and uh, Effie, actually had opportunity to strike up a conversation. Seems like they were enjoying each other. If we told her that, um, step back a little bit. Um, Diana was complaining about the whole price of the books. Like, shit, this is expensive as hell. Like, I don't even know how people got time to do all of this and pay for their books. And then if it conveyed to her that, hey, sometimes the TAs, got the materials or the books in their office you can go over there and see what they can do and then the the camera pans to the young guy who has feelings for diana so we're gonna see how that pans out eventually he's gonna get he's gonna get what he came for but who knows what type of relationship he's really looking for but eventually if he keeps doing what he's doing right now he's gonna be in good graces but diana still has an eye out for Tariq. so let's move on man so back at Western Holdings, we see Chad. He's walking through the hallway. He's clowning one of the guys, talking about his tie and all that shit like that. He shows up at his desk, and there are three gentlemen, one sitting down at the at the computer and 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 two standing up. And they was like, there he is. Nigga, pack your bags. It's time to go. He was like, What's, what, what the heck is going on? And it was like, no, we do not allow this type of... Whatever you got going on on your computer, we got evidence right here. Your ass got to go. He was like, no, what? Uh, show me what it is. Show me what it is. And they said, <laughs> they said no, uh, security. They said, I don't get that nigga up out of here. And he was like, well, y'all going to hear from my attorney. My dad is going to sue y'all for every dollar y'all got. And that may very well be. But we know people with the money. Uh, they make things work out for the way they want it to go down, right? So anyhow, moving past that, we later find out that the person that set up Chad was actually Brayden because he didn't like the way he was talking to his girl, Kiki. So Kiki checked out on, you know, she checked it for what it was, and she was like, that was you, wasn't it? He was like, oh, yeah, that was me. So, of course, she took him to a private floor, and uh, they did what they do. They did what they did. They fooled a lot up there. I don't know exactly what they did, but I know what I would have done. But anyway, so Kiki and Braden, they did what they did on the private floor. And uh, we'll move on from there. So now Tariq shows up at Tate headquarters this time. And there's, uh, what's her name? Bruchon or Bouchandra? Oh, it's something I can't, I never can say her name right. I think it's Bruce Shonda or Bruce Shonda. And she's sitting at the desk and he was like, what you doing right here? And she was like, oh, I just started my brand new job today. And, uh, <laughs> and she was like, and, and my internship. And he was like, what the heck going on? Because I was supposed to be the one getting the internship. But in turn, you're taking my spot. And she was like, no, I didn't take nobody's spot. It wasn't given to me. I earned the spot. But um, finally, um, Tate comes out and he's like, oh, my brother, my brother. To hell with that. I don't want to hear that. What happened to my internship? And he was like, nigga, I'm going to just be straightforward. Nigga, you bad for business. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty much what he said. Nigga, you bad for business. And um, in order for me to get campaign dollars, I need to get you up out of this situation, and I'm going to have to let you roll on out. But you be good, though. 
you know what I'm saying? You do good and be good on the outside of these four walls. But in here, I'm trying to get that campaign money. And I can't do that with you. I thought I could, but somebody has already told me that you too much trouble. You too hot right now. All right, so this is the part that I, I feel like the episode started to shift in a different direction. Because the plot started to thicken every turn. Every scene got got harder and harder. And I was loving the way that it was transitioning, right? So when Kane and Lorenzo had their conversation, their back and forth, Kane tells him that Drew isn't ready. He's telling him that Drew is not focused enough. And I've said that before on my previous episode. Right now, Drew is just not focused. He's focused on Everett. That's it. He ain't focused on no family business. He's not focused on anything. All he's focused on is this, is this man right here in front of him. And if it's not him, then he's not there. And we're going to talk about that a little later in this episode. He's not it. And you need to stop bullshitting and put me in place and let me do what I need to do. Lorenzo brought up his own issues with Kay. What you really need to do is get your shit in order because you are the reason that a lot of this stuff is not right. I can't trust you because you're going behind my back with Mecca trying to put a hit on my head. You think I ain't know that? So he has all of these insecurities within him because he knows at the same time, I already got some shit going on over here. And then you bringing this new stuff and I ain't got time for it. Then nigga, you were trying to kill me. And see, I don't really think he meant this, but he had, he had gotten so high up in himself that he re he didn't realize what he was saying. And that's really why I tell people, when you get angry, you got to think about your thoughts before you put them out there. Because at this point, I don't really think Lorenzo was really thinking about what he said to the degree that he said it and who he was saying it to. Like, you got a nigga that's determined as Kane to prove his point that I'm supposed to be the number one and y'all not respecting me enough. I'm probably not going to say that to that nigga. Truth be told, I'm not saying it to him because he's going to do exactly what I said so he can prove, he, he can prove me wrong. So anyway, so he tells him pretty much, if you want to get things right with your mama Monet, then go out there and find out who kills him. Then we can maybe talk about it. And there you go. Kane went out there and did exactly what you told him to do. Now we're going to have problems. Damn. Damn, damn, damn. Oh, man, man. Let's get good. The plot is taking the man. So, Avery and Drew, they talking about, you know, um, he needs his support. Needs you to be at this event. He's talking about moving to the OKC, to Oklahoma City. And um, Drew is like, you're going to be the only black man out there. Woo, woo, woo. And then he says, well, I really want you to be at this dinner tomorrow night. I ain't going to go full out there. I'm just telling you I need you to be in my pocket. And that's pretty much it. Um, going to the next scene, Evelyn came to see Monet. Now, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, she told her um, about... Um, her situation, she told her about um, um, how her boys have been supporting her, and she was actually going to drop off a rack for it, you know what I'm saying? And I thought that was commendable. Then I also liked how she informed her, hey, there's this white cop named Whitman that's been asking questions, looking around for information. So, on Frank, so I just need you to know this. And, and Monet was like, I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? And she was trying to give her some money, but she didn't take it. You see what I'm saying? But um, I thought that was pretty good. So moving on, we see Tariq, Effie, and Brayden. They're all back uh, in the dorm, and they're discussing Tariq's internship. Now, we all know from the previous discussion that Tariq has lost his internship, and we see that um, old girl from the classroom. We see that old girl from the classroom, Brashonda. I, think, I hope I'm saying her name. <laughs> uh, we see old girl from fine ass girl from the, from his classroom, Bruchanda, something like that, Bruchandia. I can't. I don't even know how you say her name, but anyhow, she actually got the internship. So they're talking like it ain't right. 
he should have never given your internship away. And Teresa was like, right. You know what I'm saying? And then Brandon was like, well, just help it, man. Just come, come on and work with me and my pops. And and um, Tariq is like, it's just not easy. You know, we got into trouble, right? And you still ended up making a six-figure job. It doesn't work like that for everybody. And I was like, right. It does not work like that for everybody, Brayden. So I thought there was a whole bar that, that, that Tariq just dropped on him like that. But he, you know, the one thing I can say about Brayden, he's a little naive and stuff. But the, but the one thing that I do not question about him at this point is his heart. That man loves Tariq, man. So he's looking out for Tariq. Even when he took the stand, he was looking out for Tariq. Now, like I said before, he doesn't think all the way through things. But right now, what he's feeling inwardly is that I'm enjoying my damn self. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm out here making my own bread and not on my daddy's, you know, name. I'm doing it all for me. And for with Tariq, he has this bond. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, no, by any means necessary, I'm going to get Tariq this job at my, at my pop's company. You know, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So... And, and Tariq, you know, they, they go back and forth about it. And they say, we will not have no drugs or anything at, at, at the office. We will keep it straight clean. And Tariq agreed to it. He was like, but there can be no drugs absolutely at all. No drugs. And they both agree. Right? So, next we see Effie and Brayden. Tariq gets up out of the bed. He said he got to go handle something. And as soon as Tariq leaves the room, Brayden jumps his ass up and he runs over to Effie like, we got to fucking tell him what about Lauren, like what's going down with Lauren. And Effie's like, no, we taking that shit to our grave. Like, we're not saying nothing. We ain't trying to make him, you know, even more upset than what he is right now. Like, we're going to leave it as it is. And that's, and that's what it's going to be. And I agree for right now. Just leave it for what it is. And we'll move on from there, right? So now we head over to a vacant building where we see Kane with two guys tied up to chairs. And it is what I thought it was when I did the preview. I thought he was holding somebody hostage because I, I saw him with the blowtorch. So the first guy he was interrogating, both of these niggas said they ain't no shit. You know what I'm saying? They was like, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. And then he started pulling out that torch. And he hit one guy by the hand. And he was like, oh, it was a bald dude. Dark jacket. <laughs> big collar. And some zippers. I was like, ain't that some shit? As soon as that torch started hitting, nigga, you remember everything. <laughs> I ain't seen nothing. I ain't seen nothing. Oh, it was a bald head nigga with a dog jacket. A big collar with a big necklace on his neck. And zipper, nigga. I was like, all right. And then the black dude, I thought he was going to hold up a little bit harder. And uh, he said, man, I ain't seen nothing. I ain't seen nothing, man. I, and then all of a sudden, he was like, all right, I ain't going to do nothing to you. You know, he cut off the flame and everything. And then he got up behind him. And then uh, he put that flame on his head. He was like, oh, I saw a car with a, with a bus of tail. <laughs> I was like, man, I thought you didn't know nothing, bro. But anyway, man, that, that was pretty much it. He was able to get the information that he needed from these pilots and, and the people that were on that plane for that day. So then we move on and um, we see um, Tariq and both Tariq and Braden. They're back at, you know, at Western Holdings and they meet, I guess Braden introduces him slightly to, or at least shows him the guy that's the one that's dealing all the drugs and stuff at, you know, at, at the location and how he does it. So while they're doing that and they're talking, they hear this loud voice from them at, at the top of the stairs, like Braden family meeting right down now. So Braden's like, what the hell? So he gets up to the office and his dad is going, and he's going in on him. Like, how the hell did Tariq get into this facility? I told you I didn't want that nigga up here. And that's exactly what he was saying. Even though he didn't say those words, I can hear he and his brother and them saying those words. I didn't want that up here. So why is he up here? And I told you to stay separated from him. But his brother Robert was like, you know, we need him to be here because he's our new intern. 
But it's also, and this is how folks be talking, man. I loved how they did this because this is real talk. This is exactly how it goes down in corporate America. Listen to me when I say it. That man said, clear as day, it is good for diversity because it looks great for business. It ain't good for diversity because it's the right thing to do to have different people, you know, working at, at in corporate America or in the office where you can bring and generate all types of different ideas. No, it was good because it looks good on paper to have, oh, we got Tariq St. Patrick up here working as an intern. It looks great on paper. We're not going to give that nigga a for real job, but it looks great on paper. So, he just pretty said inclusivity and diversity. It looks great. You know what I'm saying? And that's real talk. And Trace is mocking his uncle like, oh, what the hell that mean? Like, he's mocking him. And he's like, are you being serious? Like, are we going to now celebrate Juneteenth? And that nigga's been dead serious. He's dead ass serious, bro. And that's how they talk. Not all of them. I'm going to say all, not all. But a lot of them do think that way. So anyway, so moving on. Effie is back in the house. At the hotel, she's packing it up, packaging up the product, and she's getting you, you know, ready specifically for different universities. When you see her writing the the names of the schools on them, so she's already in in the process working it up, working the work. All right. So now we see Diana, and and she comes. Diana comes to um, visit Salem. Right to to check to see if she can, you know, get in there and check out some of the books that she needs for her material for her coursework. And he mentioned to her, "Yeah, come on in." And she was like, "You know, she in his head, from what she shared with him, obviously is that she's struggling. She doesn't have the means. So as she walks in, she looks as you know, all she always looks great. So I'm not gonna say she doesn't look great. She always looks the ball. So when she walked in there." The first thing I noticed is that she did have a Balenciaga backpack on. And in my head, you know, I don't really know what that is. I don't know what that costs because for me, myself, and I, I ain't buying that shit. But at the same time, you know, for people that check out brands and stuff like that, they would know the cost. So his first, you know, the inkling in his head is, how the hell you, you can't pay for your books and your supplies, but you able to afford a Balenciaga, you know, backpack. So then she has to pretty much tell me, oh, my parents going to take care of everything and sell for my damn books. That still don't make no... <laughs> that still don't make no damn no sense because, I mean, if you're able to do everything else, just go ahead and pay for my books too. It just doesn't make sense. Make it make sense. And that's a whole message right there. Message! People out here, and I'm not judging anybody. You do what you want. You know, you do what you want with your money. That's your money. You do what you want to do. But at the same time, you hear people struggling. But then you see them living a life of no struggle. And I'm like, how are you able to pay your bills? But you're asking me for money. Or you're asking somebody else for a loan. And you living your best life on somebody else's money. Let me move on before I get in trouble, man. Let me move on. So... Next we see, yeah, next we see Monet driving, and she gets pulled over by Whitman, um, who tells her, who pretty much tells her, you know, hey, you're going to listen to me for what I got to say. I ain't really interested in what you got to talk about. Where were your whereabouts when the whole situation went down with Carrie? That's what I want to know when she got murdered, because I don't believe it was a suicide. And you know why I know? Because your nigga, your, your son, Freaky Zeke, was up there telling everything in, in, you know, in the room when he was being interrogated. That's why I know. And so he mentioned Zeke's name. And of course, you know, she was like, oh, you spoke to Zeke? So he was like, yeah, I spoke to him. And then also with that, when he gave me that information. I took my ass over there to look at the camera. There was a camera, a traffic camera, that showed me that. I don't know if he's been truthful or not, because we're going to talk about this a little bit later in this episode. But he pretty much said there was a traffic camera that caught you in this very same vehicle driving from that vicinity. So why were you over there? Now, I don't have enough proof right now to lock your black ass up, but eventually that's what I'm going to do. And once I get that proof, that's what I'm coming to do. All right, so... 
Uh, and then he also brought up, um, before he left, he also brought up the special relationship with Detective Ramirez. Now, he had a card in his hand, and he said he got that one directly from, from Zeke. I was like, damn, Zeke, in front of Gray, nigga, you causing me. <laughs> causing issues, bro. Like, so Monet calls, you know, she, she, so after that situation, he breaks her side view mirror and left the side view mirror, and she was like, oh, shit. But anyway, so um, Monet calls Davis to complain about the whole situation. Um, so Davis calls in Sax, and he, and Sax, he's yelling at the top of his lungs, like, Sax, get your ass in here. So Davis asks, um, if Jennifer is working with Whitman, and why is Whitman interrogating uh, Monet? Why is he pulling her over, harassing her? You see what I'm saying? So, I'm really looking forward to next week's episode to see what um, Sax is going to be doing as well as um, our boy Davis. We got to see what's going on with that. Um, but anyway, moving on, Sax calls Jenny Sullivan right after he talks to um, Davis to ask if she knows anything about um, if she knows anything about or anyone. Yeah, so Sax calls Jenny um, from the block to <laughs> so he calls Jenny to ask if she knows anything or anyone um, that has been spot on the penthouse, you know, on the Spears penthouse. And um, and then when he asked her that, she turned old, you know, turned around and there was somebody off to the side looking at some of the images up on the board. I couldn't really tell who it was, but I believe it was that lady that came in there um, recently. Um, her name's off with a B. I can't remember. Uh, the DEA. I think that's who it was, but um, I had to go back and look at it. Um, but um, he suggested if you don't have anybody at this time, he suggested that you look into Whitman. But that was pretty much it on that point. And I think at that point, he he's just trying to stay in good graces with her at this moment because he knows he really didn't have anything at that time. So now we see Braden, both Braden and, and Tariq. They're both in the office. They're working in their cubicles. And Tariq is actually, it looks like he's at the cubicle that Chad was once at. So hopefully that's a good luck spot and not one way it's going to turn around on him where he got to be, you know, let go as well from there um, too soon, right? So, um, Braden sends a message to Kiki um, to get or to have Tyreek set up the meeting room. But I believe that Braden did that shit on purpose. Let me tell you why. Because he wanted Tariq to see firsthand what was going down in that break room. Once, and Tariq reminds me a lot of myself. Like once I see shit and I and I see how it goes and how the operate, I already know how it works. I but once I see it, I'm like, oh, I need to get into that. I can do that myself, and I could probably do it better than you. But once Tariq was able to see how those dudes were doing in inside that break room in that office meeting room, he was like, okay. I think that changed his mind, and I think that's an, 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 that was an intentional move that Braden did. So, it was a smart move. I, I give him credit for that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, moving on, um, we see them at the strip club. They're celebrating people out there, hanging out. They, they're getting lit. Um, we see both Tariq, Braden, they're talking about the moves and all that stuff, and they also point out the guy that's, you know, making all the moves with the drugs. And he told, Braden specifically tells him exactly how this guy works, how he's able to uh, put it in there like, you know, powder and stuff like protein shakes and different things of that nature. He'll place it inside their lockers and stuff like that. So he was, you know, really breaking it down for him. So as Tariq's mind is roaming, as Tariq's mind is going, he's like, okay, we can definitely do this. We can run the whole Wall Street and we can get rid of the shit that we currently got in at Wells. So it's working out exactly how Braden wanted this shit to go. So, man, I'm intrigued on how this going to go down. So um, going from there, um, Drew gets his ass handed to him. He's walking in the streets. And I believe he was supposed to be on his way to go see um, 
um, Everett at his sit-down signing event, at his signing event. But obviously he didn't make it because he got his head, he got his hand, he got his ass handed to him by the street by one of the little goo wops. And <laughs> <laughs> one of the homeless man by Lil Guap homies or Guap homies and uh, Lorenzo says uh, so so next we see Drew Drew is walking on the street it looks like a pretty decent neighborhood but as he's crossing the street there's a guy that comes up to his right and he was like hey bro you got the time so while he's looking down Old boy knocks his cell phone out of his hand and and clocks him across the face, knocks him down to the ground. So he gets his ass handed to him, and old boy turns him over on his stomach, spray paints him with the initials, and you know, you know, he was a friend of little, you know, little goo ops. Uh, I don't even know what you call him, but one of the friends of the homies, man. And um, so, with all that going down, um, they get back to the crib where Monet is taking care of Drew's face, not knowing what happened really. And Drew is like, how did the nigga know? And all this stuff. Woo, woo, woo. Lorenzo is like, we need to take care of this. We need to make this shit right for Drew and Zeke and all this stuff. So he's telling all this to Kane, right? So um, it gets better though. Um, so, <laughs> so Diana stars her new job with, you know, the dude that um, likes her. Obviously, he's walking her through all the stuff, how to do it and all this stuff. Effie and Tariq, they're coming down the hallway and they eventually walk into where Diana is. And um, she hides out in the closet while um, they're there purchasing things at the um, at the at the counter. So next we see Tate and Brayden. They meet up on a bridge and they're talking and Braden hands him an envelope with money contributing to his campaign. And he's thanking him for, you know, the services of Brushita. Or, uh, what's her name? Brushanda? Oh, man, I'm going to get that girl's name right eventually before the, end of this, uh, at the, before the end of this episode, I'm hoping. But if not, Brushanda or Brushindia, something like that. I think it's Brushanda. I'm, I'm going to make sure. I'm going to have to go back and look at that. But he's thanking him for her services, saying she's going to work out just fine. So this ain't going to set up here, strategize. No, I don't, need, I don't need Tariq up there working on that campaign. What I need him to do is focus on what we got, this bottom line. Because I ain't trying to work in my daddy's facility all this time. I'm about to get up out of here. And that's essentially what he's planning to do. So next we see Whitman comes in um, to see Jenny from the block. And, and he states that... Um, well, the DEA is there at the same time. So then he comes in, Whitman comes in, and she was like, why the hell you been harassing, you know, Monet? Why am I getting calls about that when I told your ass to stay up off, you know, off that investigation? So long story short, he says, you might need to know a little bit about what I know before you start jumping in on me. She was like, okay. So she leans back, and he's like, is old girl good? She was like, yeah, I'm part, of, I'm DEA. And he was like, okay. So... He pretty much conveys to um, to the ladies in the room that y'all possibly are looking in the wrong direction. Y'all looking at this kid, this 19-year-old kid, Tariq. He's not, the, he's not the one you need to be looking at. What you really need to be looking at is Monet. Because of all these people that's on this board, Monet is attached to everybody that's on this board in some type of way. And they had a, a picture of uh, Ramirez, and he said, oh, she been messing around with him. I think it was bigger than what y'all th- thought it was. It wasn't just he was protecting her. I believe that they've been getting it in. And they was like, oh, mm. but did you know that old girl, Jenny from the block, was getting in with Sags? Oh, you probably didn't know she was in the sack with Sags, right? Mm. But no said, we're going to move on. So Kane and uh, the Guwap. So he's over there at the warehouse. He's waiting for them to show up. Once they uh, once they come in, he shoots two people. He does like this little whistle. He shoots them immediately. And he leaves old boy. He whoops his ass real quick. And he said, you coming back with me. So after we see Kane and all that. So after that situation, Kane brings that guy back over to Monet and Lorenzo. All right. So before we get there, Drew gets a phone call or a text message from 
um, from Tariq saying, hey, we can't get in contact with Kane at this moment. We really need you to come in and step in and, you know, do what we need to get done. So, at this point, he don't went to old boy because he done, you know, he done got jumped. He done got cleaned up. And I guess he had missed, you know, that event that night. So, he came the next day trying to talk to him. Or even that night, I can't remember. Maybe it was that night. But he tried to come in and old boy was being extra sensitive. Like, no, I'm tired of it. And, you know, and he was looking out for himself. I ain't mad at him for that. But he also needs to listen to reasoning. You know, Drew is telling him, hey, I was jumped. Look at my face. Look at my face. What's going on? And he was like, no, is it one of them hoodlums that jumped you last time? So, <laughs> listen, Drew, maybe you need to just leave old boy alone. There's plenty of fish in the sea, man. Go, I mean, look, man, the sky's the limit. He ain't the only one. Let him go to OKC. But anyway, um, while he's doing that, old boy pisses him off. And you see this anger comes over. And this this evil comes inside of Drew. And his whole demeanor changes. And the reason why I'm saying that is because what he does, I don't think, is I don't believe that would have been the thing that he would have done if he was thinking logically. Right? Um, and I'm going to say that for later. So next we see Kane, Lorenzo, and Monet. They're at the bar with um uh, with the with the gang member and they was like, what's going on? And while they're while he's being questioned, I took a picture of it because I wanted to look at it because I noticed it as soon as he said those words out of his mouth. He said, I was hired to do the job. And I was hired, you know, essentially I was hired to jump Drew. And Kane looked directly at um at um at Lorenzo. I saw that because if you go back to when he knocked old boy out, he pulled everything out of his back pocket and there was a necklace with a ring attached to it. Now I had not seen that ring before, at least not for my you know, maybe I've missed it, but I had not seen that ring. Um but I thought that was pretty significant because at first I thought it was the ring. I thought it was the necklace that was on old boy's neck, on Drew's neck. But I was like, no, that didn't look like the necklace that was on Drew's neck. So um, so when he said that, I was like, mm, well, who hired him? And I was just thinking, I was like, that would be a perfect way, you know, to get your enemy out the way, set another nigga up, and now you good to go. But Kane is smart. Kane is smart, I gotta give him that because he was peeping it as he was going. I he had gotten gathered that information from those, you know, those informants of his own doing. <laughs> he was able to think about who in the hell is that? Bald headed, yeah, a bald head dude, a black jacket, and big collars. And and as soon as I seen old boy at the end of the show, I said, ah, that nigga got some big collars on. Like he gave himself away, bro. But anyway, so um if you notice when he when 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 he asked that Cain didn't say a word. So when Monet, so Monet said, well, who did it? And as soon as as soon as he started trying to talk, Lorenzo popped him in the face to shut him up. So when when he was trying to be asked about that, Cain when um so when Monet, alright, so when Monet said to him, she was like, Well, who well who set it up? Lorenzo popped him immediately. And uh, Monet was like to Kane, is this the right nigga? Is this the one that did it? Kane didn't say a thing. If you notice Kane, Kane didn't say a word about the whole situation. He just looked at it and then he pulled out the necklace out. He pulled the necklace out of his pocket and he brought it over to Monet. As soon as Monet saw the necklace with the ring, the championship ring on it, she immediately put like four or five rounds in them. Immediately. She didn't hesitate. You know what I'm saying? And then Lorenzo was pretty much, I, he probably, possibly was thinking in his head, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I'm good at this moment. So next we see Sax back at the office and Sax is creeping around Davis's office trying to see what he can find because at this point, Sullivan is like, I need my CEO, my, my CI rather, to get the information that I need to set this case because right now you're not giving me nothing and I need more than what you're giving me. So it, while he's looking around the office, he finds a drawer where, now I don't know why Davis 
Now, I don't know why Davis had the cell phone directly at the top of the desk. I'm not sure. Maybe he just got, you know, ain't nobody going to come in here. This is my office. This is my area. But he just doesn't know. Who, you know maybe he does. Now, let me take that back. Maybe Davis does know. And that would be a perfect way to do what he needs to do. I'm not able to put all of those pieces together yet. But I'm just thinking within within the... I'm just thinking about the, the whole ramification of all of this. Davis, he just ain't thinking like a standard Negro. He's thinking, you know, a couple streets ahead as well. So there's no reason, no, there's no rhyme or reason why I think he just left that at the top of the drawer for nothing, but who knows. But um, maybe it just very well would could have been. He just didn't think nobody would come in there and check his office. But also, he got cleaners and people to come in there and clean his office. So, I, I just don't know. It seems a little fishy to me. Maybe it was set up that way. But anyway, so, Sax pulls out the phone. He opens it up. And then, he sees a number in the phone. He immediately takes a snapshot of the phone. And then, the nigga turns around and calls the number, which happens, which happens to be Monet's phone. And she picks up and she conveys to him at that time, Davis, I'm good. All the information I need, I already got everything I need about Z. And Sax hangs up the phone like, oh, damn, like, this nigga been working with Monet. So, and then also what she shared with him, like, what is she talking about? All the information about Z. So, that's interesting, bro, because remember in the beginning when Davis brought the file, he had stated this is pretty much all we got on the Zeke file. There's nothing else in here. But now Monet is saying we pretty much know everything we need to know about the whole situation with Zeke. We got that covered. So I'm just wondering the information that Sachs is going to share with Sullivan now with the information that he just gathered from um, from Monet. So Ooh, I'm going to be looking for that. So, now... All right, so, when I said earlier about the whole demeanor of Drew, and I and I wanted to say this right before all the rest of this, before I could... So, when I was talking about the whole demeanor of Drew, I wanted to get into this before I got into the conclusion of this video because his whole demeanor, when he was pissed off because of how Everett, Everett had treated him, he wasn't thinking logically about what he did because if if he was thinking straight, he would not have done what he did publicly in front of all these people. Not in front of, just not just in front of these people, but if you notice the scene, it looked like there was a scene that was afar off. Looks like there was a camera that was looking directly in on the whole scene of the crime. And it looked like it was facing towards where the incident actually happened, not where his hood was turned around, but where you can actually see his face to a certain extent. Now, if they're able to follow that traffic, camera all the way down where they have multiple cameras drew is going to be in trouble and that's going to bring more issues for the family and that's not that's not the type of heat that monet needs at this point in time in her life i'm just being dead ass man but i don't think if he if he was not angry i think he would have waited till it was like in a secluded area and he would have popped him there I don't think he would have pushed that guy in front of the truck like like he did. I think he was just so angry. He was thinking out of pocket. He was not thinking correctly. And he just did the best thing that he thought he should have done, which was just pushed over boy into the street. It got the job done, but now you're possibly bringing more heat upon your family. So moving on, man. And this is where I was looking forward to. So while... Putting the body. So while they're putting the body into the back of the truck, Kane and Lorenzo, they're talking, and Kane comes up and he pretty much says, I noticed that you got your light fixed, your tail light fixed. And Lorenzo said, Yeah, I got that done a long time ago. Nigga, understand your lies, man. <laughs> understand your lies. So he said, Yeah, I got that done a long time ago. And he said, Oh, okay. Okay. But I got your ass, though. He said, old boy told, old boy. 
So Cain was like, so when Cain finished what he was saying about the, so after he asked him about the tail light, Cain pretty much said, I got your ass. He said, the descriptions that those guys gave me, he said, why is it that you pretty much, why is it that you couldn't find nobody? You've been working on this shit for a while, but you didn't think about going to the pilots. You didn't think about none of this. But it only took me this amount of time to find out exactly what happened and to retrace your steps. And then they said it was a bald man, a bald headed man with, with, you know, with a, what they say, bald headed man had a big fly collar on his head, you know, big fly collar, big collars, big zippers, black jacket, everything that he had on. <laughs> so listen, Kane is a lot of things. Kane ain't dumb. He does some idiotic things, but he ain't dumb, right? So he noticed everything to the T. And when and then he also stated that you were so gun ho about me going in to do what all of this stuff. And then he noticed his body language as he was sitting there talking about the whole setup. Oh, I was sent. I was uh uh when old boy was talking about I was uh I was hired for that job. He said, I noticed your body language. I noticed how you looked when it happened, when it went down. Nigga, you set that up. But now you know what? I got your ass. You're going to be working for me in that work that you said you weren't going to do, homie. You're going to get on that work right now. Or we're going to go ahead and talk to Monet right now, homie. And Lorenzo don't want that from Monet. Did you just see what she just did to old boy when she thought he was the one to kill Z? Lorenzo don't want that. So, yeah, man. I, I think it, mm, it's going to be good, bro.